I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. Hi, I'm Renee Williams, and welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. Billy's out today, but um, we still have a great show in store for you all. Um, today on our topics, we have uh, Dr. Jonathan Larson. He is an as assistant professor of extension entomology, and he will be talking about how bugs and or insects survive the winter. I've always kind of wondered, you know, you always think that maybe that winter with all the cold would kill them out and it doesn't. So um, he's going to let us know um, why and how they survive over the winter. And we also have Dr. Matt Springer, who is Assistant Professor of Wildlife Management in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. And he's going to be talking about how animals survive the winter. You know, sometimes I notice when it gets a little warm, you'll see some of the animals come out. And then um, when it starts snowing again, somewhere they, they go somewhere. So um, Matt should hopefully be able to shed some light on that. So we greatly appreciate you joining us today. If you have any questions, type them in the chat pod and we will get them answered. If you are on YouTube live, just uh, send me an email at forestry.extension at uky.edu and we will get those answered. So let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Larson, if you turn your camera on. Hi, welcome to the show once again. Greatly howdy, appreciate howdy. it. No worries. Uh, I'm happy to be back. I feel like a recurring sitcom character uh, from the woods today. <laughs> I and I plan up. to keep you that way. <laughs> uh, and I, I just talk about weird bug stuff. And that's kind of what we're going to oh, do here today. I love it. <laughs> uh, so we are talking today a little bit about, I'm just going to get rid of all these floating things, uh, how insects survive the winter. And this is a question that I think is a lot of fun. It's also one that I get not infrequently from the public. Uh, as part of my job, I, I do take in a lot of questions on Facebook and places like that. And people are always very curious about how insects go from one season to the next. Uh, kind of as you alluded to, a lot of people, they have this conception that surely a bunch of them freeze to death, right? Uh, that there's this cold seeping in and they just can't survive it. But insects are very well adapted to survive almost anything. They've been around for a long time. And almost every species that we deal with would have what we call an overwintering strategy. And that overwintering strategy is going to be very different species to species, but it's what helps them to transition from one year to the next. Uh, and it, it looks very different. It involves adults in some cases, eggs and others. Uh, and we'll kind of go through all the different ways that they do this. Uh, but we also can't really count on winter for pest control. There's always this hope. We get these polar vortexes or these Arctic bombs that Jack Frost's breath is going to come out and freeze all these bugs to death. That very rarely occurs. Uh, we don't get a lot of free pest control out of that just because of these overwintering strategies that we're going to cover. Uh, so the thing to start with is just talking about why this is so important for insects. Uh, insects and climate are very tied together. Uh, climate and temperature are not interchangeable words, of course. Temperature is just one thing that makes up the climate of an area. Uh, but the lives of insects are really, really strongly dictated by various climatic factors, temperature probably being the most important one, followed by precipitation and a few others. And this boils down to the fact that insects are what we call poikiliothermic, uh, which is just a fancy way of saying a bug is about the same temperature in their body as whatever it is that surrounds them. So if this ground beetle here on the far right, uh, if I had that in a container, and I put it on a counter, and it was about 70 degrees in the room that it was in, that insect's body would be approximately 70 degrees. If I took it and put it inside of a refrigerator that was set to 41 degrees, over time, that insect's body would cool to about 41 degrees because there's nothing for it to hide under, and then it would probably stop moving. It wouldn't die. Uh, there's not going to be ice crystals forming or anything, but it will go into kind of an arrested state. If I took it out of that 41 degrees and I put it into an oven that was set at 110 degrees, its body would slowly heat up to 110 degrees. There's nowhere for it to escape the heat. It could perish at that temperature. It may be able to survive, but this is just trying to highlight how their bodies are so controlled by the temperature around them. Uh, that's why you see insects hiding under things. It's why you see them finding all kinds of refuge, even in the hottest part of the summer. And the other parts of their lives that are kind of dictated by temperature include the range of where they can live. Um, we show these maps pretty frequently uh, when talking about insects of various stripes, particularly pests. 
uh, but we also build them for cool beneficial organisms like lightning bugs that you see on the left there. Uh, the range that an insect can survive in is strongly dependent on the temperature. Some insects are what we would call more northern species. Uh, some are more southern. Some, uh, if you took a bug from Florida and brought it here to Kentucky, it probably would have a harder time surviving uh, than the opposite. A Kentucky insect might be able to survive quite well down south, but it may also get too hot for it. Uh, so what I'm highlighting with these maps, the lightning bugs, the fireflies on the left there, you see that in states that are darker green, they have more species of fireflies reported from there. Uh, whereas the states kind of in the central northern part of the U.S., we see a lot fewer species of firefly there. And that just boils down to the temperature. Uh, that also is going to impact invasive species, things like spotted lanternfly. We've talked a lot about that over the last couple of years. It is in Kentucky now. Uh, but according to the most recent uh, estimates, the most re recent modeling maps, uh, it doesn't seem like Kentucky is going to be a place that the spotted lanternfly is going to thrive in. And this most likely has to do with temperature. If you kind of look across that red band there, you're seeing states like Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Iowa. Those seem to be the states that it will do the best in. This could be because of food availability, but my guess is that it's climatically in that band, very similar to their native range, and the temperature probably matches up better than a state like ours. Those are in different, slightly different growing zones compared to Kentucky. So temperature really dictates where a bug can live, and it also impacts the success that they're going to have in a given geographic area. So if we're talking about success with insects, it's not about building an app and becoming a billionaire. That's not their idea of success. It's the ability to produce more than one generation of your species in a given year. So with insects, they lay their eggs and then the eggs will hatch. And depending on what kind of insect we're talking about, they may go through complete metamorphosis, which you see displayed with this beetle on the left here. The egg hatches, out comes a larva. The larva then goes through a few instars, uh, stages of development, until it becomes a pupa. A pupa is kind of an intermediary stage between the larva and the adult. And then eventually the adult will emerge from that pupa. So this is in comparison to incomplete metamorphosis, which is seen on the right with the grasshopper. In this, the eggs hatch, and then out comes a nymph. Nymphs look vaguely similar to the adult. They're just smaller and they lack wings. So as they grow, they just get bigger and they grow their wings. There's no intermediary stage with the pupa. And with these two types of development, they have to accumulate what we call degree days to go from one of these stages to the next, to go between instars, to hatch from the egg, to emerge from the pupa if they have that stage. And degree days, uh, this is just a way of describing how temperature is accumulated sort of in the insect's body. Uh, the way that I try to explain it to folks is, okay, imagine you were building a Lego block tower. Now you put your blocks all out kind of on a table and you're given a sheet of rules. And it says you can only add a Lego block every day that it's over 70 degrees. And that's kind of how this works. They're only allowed to accrue development on days above a certain temperature. Uh, that can get sped up. If it's 90 degrees, they may accumulate multiple degree days in a day. There is an equation for that. I didn't want to bore you with math necessarily, so I didn't include it. But it's important just to point out that temperature dictates the speed at which they go through this process, which then dictates how many generations they can produce in a year. A lot of insects in Kentucky, they only get one generation a year. The eggs hatch, the larvae come out, the nymphs come out, they become adults, they produce the next set of eggs, and then they die. In a state like Florida, they may go through 7, 10, 14 generations in a year just because it's so much warmer. Uh, they use that warmth to their advantage. They use it during the growing season to, uh, to continue development. Here we see some soft flies chewing on a leaf. And if this is in a tropical or neotropical area, they're going to be able to do this a lot quicker than they would in a state like Kentucky or Indiana or even going up into Canada. Some insects are able to buffer the effects of temperature. They do this through a variety of ways, usually by developing in some sort of substrate, most commonly the soil. If you've ever gone out to your yard and pulled part of it back, you've probably seen grubs down in the soil. Those grubs live in a real climate-controlled condo, essentially. Uh, the soil is a barrier to air temperatures. It's almost a constant temperature down there. It's almost a constant humidity. And so they get to develop 
kind of at will. They don't have to suffer through these changes in temperature and the effects of precipitation as much. The other insects that live kind of out in the open and don't use a substrate, they're what we call stop and go growers. And that means that in order to accumulate growing degree days, they just kind of have to be patient. Um, they have to be exposed to the right temperatures to accumulate development. And when those temperatures aren't around, they don't regress, they don't go backwards, they're just arrested, they stop, and they don't develop at that period of time. Uh, and then when the temperature speeds back up, their body starts to catch up, and then they get to go to the next stage of life. It's actually a very fascinating way of kind of going from baby to adult. But uh, the important thing is that when winter sets in, things change a lot for insects. Uh, many of them will perish, but they will have produced something that will help start the next generation. Uh, some of them will survive in their, the current form that they have. Uh, they have to anticipate things like snow in some cases. And all of this boils down to that overwintering strategy that I was mentioning before. I don't want to make it sound like insects sort of get together and plan how they're going to do this. The overwintering strategy is just an adaptation that they've accumulated over many, many years. It's just the, the strongest way that they're able to survive. And it is nimble. If things change with the climate, there may be a change or sort of a perturbation to that overwintering strategy, and we could see a new one emerge. So I wanted to break down some of the ways that they pull this off. How do they avoid succumbing to the winter? How do they move from one year to the next? One of the most spectacular ways is through migration. Dr. Springer probably could talk a lot more about things that have backbones and fur and feathers that migrate, uh, you know, all these useless animals that are out there. <laughs> I'm going to start a rivalry with them. Uh, these are organisms that they, they take off. They go and they go somewhere else. We see it with Canadian geese. Uh, we see it with some humans, right? Maybe some of you do this. You leave Kentucky and you go to Arizona or Florida during the coldest months of the year and you enjoy a much more temperate or tropical kind of environment. And then you come back home because you don't want to live down there in the summer and experience their higher temperatures there. So you just simply pick up sticks and go as far away from the cold as possible. And then you stay warm. Insects can do this as well. Uh, they're not as famous for doing it as vertebrates are, but they are capable of migration. Uh, there are some pretty spectacular versions of this. One of them is the painted lady butterfly. We do have that here in the United States. It kind of migrates west to east in this country. Uh, but if you go to other continents like Europe and Africa, they will live in Europe during the summer uh, and avoid the heat of Africa. But then in the winter, they leave Europe and they go to sub-Saharan and a little bit above the Sahara uh, in Africa, and they overwinter in those spots. They do this over successive generations. I don't want to make it sound like it's the same butterfly flying back and forth. But it is very spectacular to see these beautiful butterflies fly these great distances. Dragonflies can also migrate. Uh, this is a species from India that will migrate across part of the Indian Ocean over to Africa and overwinter in Mozambique. It can do this over successive hops. Uh, they land in the Maldives and then the Seychelles before they land in Mozambique. But to get back to India, they don't take that same route. They actually fly straight from Africa to India. It is a direct flight, uh, just like we have from our airport to places like Orlando here in Lexington. Uh, but it's it's a more direct thing, so it takes more energy to do that. Uh, I just think it's fascinating. This shows up on Doppler radar sometimes. Uh, you can see these swarms of insects that are migrating. I would argue that the most famous migratory insect in the United States is the monarch butterfly. There's a lot of reasons for that. The monarch is a brightly colored insect throughout its life. As a caterpillar, it's yellow, black, and white. Uh, they have those tentacles kind of on their head and on their rear end. As an adult, they're orange and black. They're very noticeable. Uh, they're very charismatic. People care a lot about monarchs. This is exemplified by the fact that they almost became our national insect here in the United States. Uh, they were almost one of our national symbols. But there was some reluctance to select them uh, or to sort of elevate them to that position because they also are involved with Canada and Mexico. And it felt kind of selfish to claim the monarch as American when it really uses these other two nations as well. If there's ever a union between them, all, all of the North American countries together, maybe the monarch can be their symbol. Uh, but this is a charismatic insect that performs this migratory behavior. You've maybe seen this in your backyard or in the woods around you. Uh, here in the Eastern United States, we see monarchs move north over successive generations, starting in the spring. So I'll show you some pictures of the overwintering ones here in a moment. 
But right now they're down in Mexico in some fir forests that are around uh, Mexico City. And the monarchs that are there are going to fly north into Texas starting in the spring, and they'll start mating there. And then they'll produce eggs. The next generation of caterpillars will mature into butterflies, which will then fly north to places like Kentucky. We'll have a generation here that will then go even further north. They'll produce another generation. And then that's the one that will turn around usually around September or October, and they'll start the long flight back to Mexico City. So these aren't all the same butterfly. It's successive generations, uh, but it's a very spectacular way of moving through this continent and kind of using the, the width and the breadth of it for their flight. This is what it looks like right now down near Mexico City. The overwintering monarchs kind of cluster together in these OML fir forests. It's very beautiful. Uh, it is under threat. There is urbanization and construction that's going on that threatens these forests. Uh, there are effects as well from tourism, people coming and disturbing the butterflies, and climatic variability is also impacting them. They start to get a little skittish and think that spring has sprung, and they start to fly, uh, but then they get hit by a cold snap before they reach Texas. So there is some danger. There's some threats to the monarchs doing this. That's why you may have heard that they were added to the international red, uh, red list for endangered species, particularly specifically the migratory monarch. Uh, there's some worry that this behavior may be lost in the future. But it is really spectacular and a really good example of migration as an overwintering strategy. I also wanted to point out that we have other species that we could see what would happen if the monarch didn't do this. Uh, the fall armyworm is a good example. They only survive in the continental United States in the southern tip of Texas and the southern tip of Florida. And then every spring, summer, and fall, they migrate further and further north over successive generations. You can see those bands in this map from April to May, May to June, June to July, July to August, and then August. And those are generations of these moths moving north and north and north and making more caterpillars. But then when, when fall and winter hits, they all freeze to death. They don't migrate back down south. They just die where they're at. Uh, if the monarch didn't do the migratory behavior, this is what we would see with them as well. That brings us to the non-migratory insects uh, who have a very different way of dealing with the chill. They have to be able to confront these cold temperatures in a different way. Uh, there are important things to point out here. Insects freeze to death very differently than we do. If I set you all outside in short sleeves and shorts and it was zero degrees outside, you would start to lose body heat pretty rapidly. Uh, your body would react very poorly to this situation. Insects, since they're poikiliothermic though, they will start to cool down and chill. And depending on the temperature that they're exposed to, they may simply just be unable to move or they may start the slow process of freezing to death. And it is slower for insects. They have a lethal temperature and then a lethal amount of time that they have to be exposed to that temperature. Uh, one of the best ways to sort of exemplify this is to talk about bed bugs, which is maybe strange for a forestry show. But bed bugs are pests that get into our homes and get into our beds. I've had many clients that on cold days, they will try to take their mattress outside and leave it there in the hopes that the chill, the cold will kill all the bed bugs. But a bed bug has to be at zero degrees for five straight days before it will actually succumb to freezing. Uh, and that's hard to accomplish outdoors in an uncontrolled environment. We don't often have sustained zero degree periods here in Kentucky. And so anytime it gets above zero, you almost restart the clock. Uh, there's going to be changes to the amount of time that they have to be exposed to that cold temperature. So this is true for all insects. Uh, they freeze to death much more slowly than we do. And we don't typically have the sustained cold periods that we need to accomplish it. That is also complicated by the fact that some insects are what we call freeze tolerant, meaning they, they actually can be frozen solid and survive the process. The most famous example of this is the woolly bear caterpillar. I love woolly bears. I'm hopeful I can get to the woolly bear festival uh, out east here in a couple of years. I would really love to see it. I hear they have woolly bear races, and I think that would be quite the sight to see. Uh, but woolly bears are most famously associated with their winter prediction skills, which unfortunately are not accurate. Uh, they, they do have about the same accuracy as a scientifically trained meteorologist. I just wanted to throw that out there. 
uh, but they don't predict it better than our, our, our meteorological scientists do. Uh, this comes down to the black and the orange or brown that's on their body. It's supposed to be uh, the number of bands of black are the number of bad weeks of winter you might have, or more broadly, uh, the blacker it is, the badder the winter, uh, the browner it is, the more mild the winter. None of that is true, but interestingly, there is this weird nugget with them where they can, if it was a bad winter, they would survive. Woolly bears, as they get exposed to freezing temperatures, they begin to produce glycerol in their body, which is antifreeze. It's, the, it's basically the same thing that we put in our vehicles. And as they produce that, it means that their inner organs won't freeze because the antifreeze stops ice crystals from being able to form. Uh, they can contain the ice crystals in fat bodies. So they actually freeze their fat stores, which are, is harmless to them rather than you know, their hearts or their stomachs uh, or their brains. All of that is protected by this glycerol. And then as they start to thaw out, they'll just crawl away uh, and continue their process anew. That leads us to kind of the last group. And that's the ones that they have to avoid freezing. They can't tolerate it as well. And so they have to have a warm spot uh, basically to survive the cold air temperatures of winter. And this comes down to having a harborage. Uh, insects do this in a variety of ways. This is why it's hard for an Arctic bomb to kill them, because even if the air temperature is zero degrees, it's not zero degrees underground where these white grubs are. It's not zero degrees inside of this leaf that's inside of a pile of leaves that may be under a blanket of snow. Uh, it's not zero degrees inside of these eggs that are inside of the bag made by the mama bagworm that we see on the right. So using all of these different substrates, harborages, uh, even the snow itself, they can avoid those cold air temperatures. Some of these insects, unfortunately, this involves them using our structures. And if you live in or near the woods, uh, basically anywhere, I have no doubt that you've experienced some of this. Uh, our homes mimic overwintering sites in a lot of ways. Uh, some of these insects use cliff faces and our homes do kind of resemble a rocky outcrop especially if you have bricks or stone on the outside of it. Uh, the other thing is your house is just noticeably warm. Uh, it looks like a deluxe kind of premium heated log, and they're very keen to try it out. Uh, instead of flying to Florida, they'll just go to your house, basically. The color seems about right. We also have homes with large south and western facing exposures. Uh, that's sort of a, a beauty thing in construction, but it also means that our house heats up in a way that's very appealing to them, thanks to the sun. Our houses are the right height. And unfortunately, due to kind of the whims of construction, there's always lots of easy access. There's always a gap in the caulking somewhere. There's always a hole in a screen somewhere. There's always a gap in your siding. There's always somewhere that these things can use. Uh, and they can squeeze through these little openings and then gain access to your attic, to your soffit, even the wall voids in your home and use them. There are two that are most famous for this. Uh, the first one is the multicolored Asian lady beetle. This is a real lady beetle. I just want to throw that out there. I have many questions that start about this insect by saying, uh, I want to know more about the fake ladybug. It's not a fake ladybug. Uh, it's not native to here. It's an invasive species, but it is a true lady beetle. It, it's in the same group as the pink ladybug and all the others that are native to here. Some people call them Asian ladybugs. Some people call them Halloween beetles because that's about the time of year that they start to notice them in their home. Uh, and some, some people refer to them as the Asian beetle, uh, just sort of shortening the whole thing to those two words. Uh, they were brought here purposefully as a biocontrol experiment. Uh, as with all lady beetles, they go through this complete metamorphosis. They eat a lot of pests, and then they overwinter as adults. Most insects overwinter as either an egg or a pupa in those protected areas that I was describing. The ones that overwinter as adults uh, they are the ones that can kind of become pests in our homes and in our offices and buildings because they mistake uh, those areas for these logs. So all of those are lady beetles that you see crawling out from under this fallen timber here. Uh, and it looks like it's spring in this image. So they're coming out and they're getting ready to fly away and begin the season. Uh, the temperature is what tells them that things are changing and then their food starts to dwindle. And that's what pushes them to move towards overwintering sites. So here we see congregations of the lady beetle on the outside of a building. Um, as they cluster together, they produce an aggregation pheromone and it recruits more of them to that same spot. 
as I mentioned before, they like uh, houses with south and western facing exposures, and they prefer houses that are either taller than other homes in the area or are up on a hill. Uh, it seems like they're attracted to those. And they also like it uh, when the light is turned on and if your house is a lighter color. They easily find cracks and crevices and concealed areas to wait out the winter. Here is just a big pile of dead ladybugs uh, that somebody scooped out of their home. They're called the multicolored Asian lady beetle, and you can see in this image why that is. Uh, they come in reds, kind of yellow, uh, different colors of orange. They can have many spots or no spots at all. Uh, that's how they get that name. They're not feeding or mating when they're in your home. They only want to use it to chill out and wait out the winter. But some days it gets warmer and they start to walk around because they think it's spring. And then we start to interact with them. They're annoying when they do this. They can be noisy. Uh, you can hear them kind of skittering sometimes. And they are quite smelly. Like all ladybugs, if you touch them, they leak a goo out that smells very musky. Uh, this is called reflexive bleeding. Uh, so they push part of their blood out. And if you do this enough, you can get it on you. It may induce an allergic reaction in you uh, that can stain light colored objects. Uh, sometimes wallpaper and drapes get stained by them. Uh, they also will bite if you handle them. Uh, they're one of the few lady beetles that will bite in defense. So for all those reasons, we get very aggravated by them. The other big one that gets into our homes is the brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, this is another invasive species. It's mainly considered an ag pest, but every autumn, uh, they start to come into human dwellings and, and office buildings and warehouses. So here's a big cluster of them hanging out on what they would normally use, a tree, but they will uh, switch to using your home in a pinch. And again, they're not feeding or mating. They're active on warmer days. I've had quite a few crawling around here on these kind of temperate winter days. I found one on my toothbrush uh, yesterday morning as I was getting ready to go to work. Uh, they are smelly when disturbed. I like this cartoon on the right uh, where the, the stink bug is tooting. Uh, my daughter thinks that's pretty hilarious. Uh, it's a weird odor. It's often likened to coriander or sort of just a spicy smell. Uh, some people are allergic to exposure to this and they end up with hives uh, if they're touching too many of the stink bugs. They prefer high and cool locations as well. They may get in soffits, attics, the siding. Uh, they like narrow spaces. They want to be sort of uh, snug as a bug in a rug. They want to be in these kind of tight cracks and crevices where they can cluster together and hang out. So think about those kinds of spots. If you see groups of these clustering on the outside of your home, either the stink bugs or the lady beetles, you can spray them with soapy water and kill them and prevent this invasion that happens. Uh, reducing lighting outside can help. Uh, this is going to start at the end of August, the start of September. You'll start to notice this behavior begin. And so that would be when I would start looking and scouting the outside of my home to see if you can spritz these clusters of them before they actually get inside the house. Uh, with that, I was going to turn it back over to you and maybe we can answer some questions. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. You know, I'm going to have to get you on a show that says, you know, bugs that can actually harm you because I never would have thought about a ladybug doing that. <laughs> you know? you know, if they were crawling, you just kind of let them crawl over you. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it, it's not super common that they'll bite you. I'm, I'm guessing some of the people listening in today have been bitten by them. Uh, and it's usually that species. You just pick them up. And if you try, if you kind of pinch them, they'll pinch back. It doesn't draw blood or anything like that normally, but it is startling because, yeah, people have this conception of, oh, they're just cute little ladybugs. Right. But no, they, they're actually vicious predators and they have teeth to do that job. Wow. OK. <laughs> but, yeah, that, I wasn't expecting that oh, one. I was like, like bucks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they, they're also that that species in particular is so interesting. They also get in clusters of grapes. Uh, so as grape uh, growers are harvesting. They don't know the lady beetles are hanging out inside of the cluster of grapes and then they throw it in the the wine production vats and you get ladybug taint that that juice i was saying that they'll leak out to protect themselves mm -hmm. it seeps into the wine and then it ruins a whole vat uh it, and it, it tastes pretty bad okay. i have tasted them before as an entomologist you have to do that to graduate <laughs> ew all right <laughs> Well, on that note, no. <laughs> well, thank you again for joining us. I greatly appreciate it. <laughs> I, I'm Matt. Um, you know, moving on to now, um, we just heard about insects. Now, what do animals do in the winter? So we have Dr. Matt Springer here to talk to us about animals and how, how they survive the winter. 
I don't know if I want to like leave this idea of drinking lady bug juice. Bug juice. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I'm going to kind of present the alternative um, as the much fuzzier, happier things that we, we like to see. Not that we don't like to see stink bugs and ladybugs. Um, <laughs> but I will go with the cute and cuddly side um, uh, for the wildlife in the winter. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to get my screen going uh, here. And I don't have as cute of a little picture of a praying mantis to start. That I looks have, good, though. <laughs> I have the interplay between um, rodent and predator, uh, which is a, a very common sight in winter and one that um, kind of exhibits uh, this um, push and pull that predator and prey have in winter, um, where in most cases, um, as uh, Jonathan kind of alluded to, it's basically about survival. Um, everything that you know most wildlife are doing is either uh, behavior-wise, uh, adaptations are all about either survival or reproductive success. Uh, and the, that holds true um, in winter months as well, where most species are, their only concern is about making it through these months to a easier time to survive. Um, you know, Jonathan had mentioned the, the strategies uh, that uh, insects have with basically uh, being, um, for a better term that we like to call in our world, uh, wildlife cold-blooded. Um, you know, we have um, species that are like that, but, um, you know, we also, for the most part, have a lot more warm-blooded species that um, exhibit different behaviors on, on how to survive. So there's their physiological abilities uh, vary and their tolerances vary. As Jonathan did a wonderful job pointing out with all those climatic masks and range distributions. And uh, he saved me a whole bunch of time as I'm getting rid of, don't have to have those slides in here now. So uh, I thought he did a wonderful job talking about that. Um, but we have uh, basically three different strategies that exist within wildlife species. You have uh, the version that's like us where uh, we are warm blooded and um, our body temperature needs to stay roughly at the same point to function physiologically, uh, no matter what month it is, and no matter how active we are, um, we need the you know to stay right around 98.6 ish um, to have success uh, in in staying alive. Um, that does not hold true across all wildlife species. Um, you know, Jonathan did a great job talking about insects and how they are um, you know able to kind of. Well, not able to. They do respond to the fact that their body temperature is driven by the temperatures that are outside. They are not producing their own body heat. Um, so, if you you know, in the realm of wildlife, that would be our amphibians and reptiles that are cold blooded. That they're going to um, respond to the external temperatures, and their body is going to react to those. And, and their activity levels are and their uh, metabolism are driven by um, whatever temperature is outside. And similar to um, you know insects, uh, we have species uh, that are able to produce uh, that antifreeze in their blood. Uh, thinking of the wood frogs that are up in Alaska that can basically have 67% of their fluid in their body freeze uh, and still survive because of the same kind of uh, chemicals being present in their body. The um, third one strategy is one that we see with things that. Um, hibernate um, in some form or another, things like bats that have multiple set points um, that they survive at, where in the summer they're able to maintain a body temperature, they're really active. Uh, come autumn and the winter, they can actually drop their body temperature and reduce their metabolism and their heartbeats and all the other functions um, downwards uh, to maybe 10% or less of what their normal function would be, uh, all able to survive. So things like bats and bears, um, have this ability to, to change basically their met metabolic functioning to allow them to stay alive during colder, um, less bountiful food supplies uh, months. Most of this, uh, as John talked about, is somewhat driven by how mobile is the species uh, and what then do they eat? So can they get away and is there enough food around? And if um, both of those are no, then they have come up with some adaptation to allow them to um, stay, around, stay alive. And, and if they did, they wouldn't be a species anymore. We won't be talking about um, I also have fun cartoons um, and figures in here. Um, so migration, as Jonathan alluded to, is, is one major strategy. 
And you know, we in wildlife define this basically as the act of moving from one spatial location or unit to another. And that activity is done solely to promote fitness and survival of that species. They can be relatively short, um, but often when we think about migration, uh, it's, it's long distance. Uh, however, in wildlife, um, we have the idea of al altitudinal migration, where you may move up and down a mountainside, uh, or you have latitudinal mi migration, where you may move north to south or south to north, depending on what side of the equator you're on. Um, and all of this really is, you know, related to the idea of exploiting whatever resources are there on a seasonal basis. Um, you know, we, I often pose the question to my students, uh, do birds migrate north or do they migrate south for the winter? So um, which resource are they trying to exploit? Uh, are they coming up north to, to um, basically use all the, you know, in terms, you know, Jonathan was making fun of wildlife, I'm going to make fun of all the food supply of bugs, because that's all that bugs are, and insects are, is food. Um, are they taking advantage of that burst of, of availability there, or are they going and flying south to get away from the cold? Um, and often it's probably both. Um, but you know, we've we've always um, in grade school we've always heard birds fly south for the winter. Well, they also fly north for the summer. Um, so we don't want to overlook that. This is really just movement to take advantage of resources. There's some pretty cool behaviors uh, related to um, survival success uh, with certain species where you have what's called migrational homing, um, where birds will tend to migrate to the same location uh, year after year. Uh, populations will migrate to the same location, but individual, you know, we have great examples uh, from the waterfowl world where the individual ducks will migrate to the same prairie pothole um, to nest and then go down to the exact same refuge in, say, uh, Louisiana to spend the entire winter. Uh, so they're just hopping back and forth, and they, vary, they may vary a little bit in the route they take, but they almost they can be very, um, uh, have a high flash to, um, to certain locations and, and return year in, year out. It's one thing that we actually take advantage of in wildlife uh, management, allowing us to catch animals and, and monitor them year after year. Uh, but it also helps us to understand what habitats uh, may or may not need to be conserved. Um, also, whenever you move across the landscape, um, sometimes climate um, or other issues may cause an animal to get confused. Uh, and if you're a birder, you very well are aware of here in the last couple of months, the fact that we had some flamingos that had spread across all the East Coast, uh, including um, here in Kentucky, um, they can get lost or pushed around by weather events or lost in migration. Uh, and you get, you know, they're not perfect in how they navigate landscapes and movement is risky and movement is sometimes confusing, especially if you've never done it before. Uh, so you get some animals that may get lost. They do have some other really cool physiological adaptations that allow them to go through these behaviors. Um, for instance, um, many of the birds that do long distance migrations have uh, their body structure and physiology changes drastically as they prepare to migrate. Um, you know, they, they go through this process of basically consuming their own stomachs, um, shrinking their, their organs down and putting on lots and lots of muscle mass and fat so that they can fly very long distances without stopping. Uh, and then upon arriving where they're going to be for a long period of time, whether that's nesting or wintering, they will start that entire process backwards and, and regrow their ability to have a much bigger stomach and process a lot more food, reproductive organs and all that. Um, so they're, they have a lot going on to, to deal with the ability to migrate. Um, so it's, it's really, really interesting if you start thinking about that and, and how animals have kind of evolved to, to deal with um, specifically surviving winter conditions. We already heard about this. Uh, from Jonathan. Uh, it is a very um, cool um, behavior uh, in insects. They are not the only ones, as Jonathan mentioned. Uh, however, in wildlife, we uh, have uh, gone through the process of trying to claim the monarch here uh, in the last few years, mostly because um, threatened and endangered species uh, get housed within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, unfortunately, the monarch is moving closer and closer to that designation. Uh, the news just came out this past week about the size for the overwintering uh, population in Mexico this year, and it was a drastic decrease. 
uh, from last year. So not good news, but um, because Jonathan covered this, I won't really spend a whole lot of time on it. Uh, other than I will start talking about some other migrations, right? We know birds migrate quite a bit. Um, bats, uh, cetaceans, so uh, pinnipeds, so your your whales, your seals, uh, walruses, um, your basically your your um, ocean dwelling, sea dwelling mammals, um, uh, many large hooped herb, uh, herbivores. They all go under latitude, latitudinal migration. Um, so one of the big examples in Africa is the wildebeest, who is consistently moving around, taking advantage of resources through space. Um, there's some other altitudinal ones in the mammal world um, that include things like lemmings um, that will you know, move up and down um, uh, mountainsides. Uh, elk commonly do this. Uh, sheep, uh, mountain goats uh, that are going to go up and down. This happens a lot in the western part of our country um, with you know, where animals are, are following the snow lines where they still can continuously get food. Um, but it tends to be like the place that has less predators around. So they're kind of finding this balance. Um, there is a, a funny um, Disney movie that came out uh, about lemmings. And some of you may remember it that it talks about lemming migration and throwing. And uh, as, I, as I put in the, the classroom when I teach this, is yeeting them off of a cliff. Uh, into the ocean during the migrations where you have mass suicide, uh, which was completely made up by the folks that made this Disney movie. They don't do that, but they do migrate. Um, there are other versions of migration um, that are not as extreme. Uh, these happen within the herp community, so your, your reptile community, uh, where things like snakes um, will move to hibernaculums. Um, on an annual basis in both um, spring, they come out of them and in fall, they go to them to spend the winter uh, where you may go into these large abandoned mines or caves. Uh, and there may be hundreds of individual snakes that come to that exact location year in and year out. That's much more common the further north you get. Um, and often we hear about it with rattlesnakes, uh, but there's other versions of it um, through many, many species. Uh, if you go over to Southern Illinois in the Shawnee National Forest, they actually have what's called Snake Road, um, where you have uh, these bluffs that are touching up against um, uh, wetland areas. Uh, and every fall and spring, you have mass movement of snakes and other um, amphibians that are going from um, the wetlands or to the wetlands, depending on the time of year. Uh, they shut down a three and a half mile long stretch of road uh, because of the number of, of uh, species that, and, and uh, individuals that move across that road to get to and from their hibernation. It's a really neat trip. Um, if you want to see a lot of different um, amphibians and snakes uh, in a very short time period, uh, it's right where I did my PhD. And um, we would take walks in the spring when they're coming out and you could easily see a hundred some snakes in, in, in one walk if you time it appropriately. So I mentioned um, that idea of uh, multiple set points that mammals uh, or species can can use to survive. And that's relating to this idea of torpor or hibernation, which is what we commonly think of as a main strategy for animals that don't migrate to survive. We in Kentucky only have a few species that are true hibernators. Um, you know, things like uh, your herps are more often are, are box turtles and snakes um, or groundhogs for, on the mammal side um, are usually much more on the true hibernator where they are in a long steady set uh, state of low metabolic activity. The alternative to that is the idea of torpor. And torpor is really uh, basically short-term hibernation, um, or you can look at it the other way where hibernation is long-term tor torpor. But torpor is this cycle of metabolic activity that goes up and down through the wind. Um, and, you know, we may have, with bats, it's common to have about a two-week cycle where they actually, um, their activity level gets up. They, if it's a warm day, they may come out of their, their location that they're hibernating in, a cave or a tree uh, bark, um, and go for a flight in the winter. Um, so you may go outside in January, if it's 55, 60 degrees, look up, and there might be a bat flying around, just like as you'd see in the summer. Uh, the big thing with that is, though, they're not expecting really to find food. They may find some, uh, but 
Uh, there's not enough around for them to survive, but it's just more of a trying to get up, get active and, and go back down, um, reduce their metabolic activity and go back into that state and complete the cycle again and again until it becomes warm consistently and they're able to maintain that higher metabolic activity for a longer period of time. Um, in order to succeed with this uh, basic strategy, you need to be, have the ability to build up a lot of um, nutritional reserves uh, to, to survive in the winter, right? So bats uh, with that metabolic activity that picks up and down with no food coming in, uh, they will build up um, food reserves and fat um, reserves on their body, uh, go into that hibernation or that torpor um, in the fall at a much higher weight than when they come out. Um, it's often what gets bears in trouble, which we're going to talk about not too long. Uh, other strategies that um, animals uh, will use in, in the winter to survive is um, one that um, may or may not benefit forests, uh, depending on how you look at it. But um, many species will actually cache food uh, for another time, usually in time of stress when there's not much food available. Uh, this can be a short period cache or a long period. Uh, and often it relies uh, on the ability of the individual species to, to have a great set of, of spatial memory. Where did I put those seeds? Where did I put those nuts to go find them? Uh, there's a couple different strategies that come into play here where you have may have something like um, squirrels that will scatter hoard where they're basically getting as many uh, acorns and other nuts as possible and just burying them, burying them anywhere within their home range um, knowing that, you know, when they need to find something, there's enough nuts buried that they'll probably come across one. So it's a random kind of search as they look. They don't remember where they bury all their nuts. Um, and it's estimated that they only find about 50% of the, the acorns that they actually bury, which bodes really well for acorns germinating and becoming trees. Um, whereas birds like nuthatches um, are really good at spatial memory. And they have been found to have upwards of 30,000 different storage spots for seeds within their home range. Uh, as someone that has a log home, I have found uh, bird seed stored inside the logs uh, of the walls of my house because of nuthatches. I've watched them do it, and then I've watched them come back and grab them um, and use them later. Uh, there's other versions of this that are less known. So moles will actually bite the heads off of worms, earthworms and kind of like stomp them down into a spot in the cold when their metabolic activity is really low, they won't move a whole lot. And then they come back to them and consume them later. Um, and if they forget about them, the worm regenerates and goes on and, and, and with its existence uh, and it works out. But if um, the moles do need it, they are, are basically um, caching it in a very odd way uh, for later use. To go along with this, uh, another cool physiological adaptation that's known to occur in birds, specifically chickadees, is that they will actually grow their, their frontal cortex uh, by upwards of 17% to help them remember where they have cached their seeds. Um, so there's been, a, as you would imagine, an entire line of research that went into how does that happen and why, why can't we figure out how to make us be able to grow our brains in that fashion? Um, other cool adaptations uh, in winter um, is, you know, a, not necessarily with uh, metabolic um, reduction, but just general activity re reduction, um, trying to reduce movement, keep those calories um, as long as you possibly can uh, in your body and conserve energy. So deer will often not move around until they go out to feed and then they will go lay back down and let their rumen do its job, which produces its own body heat to keep them warm, just like cattle and, and, and whatnot. Um, Waterfowl, uh, who often will ride that line of free thaw in water, um, will actually make to, to keep from migrating further south uh, when there's a hard freeze, they'll congregate in large groups on a water body and they'll work together basically with movement to, to swim around in a water hole, maintain it uh, being open, which helps them with predator uh, avoidance, right? So a coyote does not want to go do a jumping leap into a, a giant open pool on a lake. Uh, unless it knows it's going to get a meal. Um, and um, so Canada geese will, and ducks will sit there, they'll swim around, keep that water moving, keeping it from freezing. And they'll wait till the hottest part of the day to go fly and go get food. They will go feed very quickly and return and, and get back to that hole and maintain um, it being open um, by just swimming around and keeping from freezing. Uh, other um, behaviors, um, so when we have extreme drops or increases in temperature, it's going to very directly impact 
uh, foraging uh, events from many wildlife species in our state, uh, as well as when we have major storms, blizzards, ice storms, uh, a lot of times um, species will just hunker down trying to um, basically ride it out uh, and make sure that they can make it through. Not everything that happens in winter is related to survival. Uh, we have many species that uh, are actively um, trying to make more of themselves in the winter uh, or have cool uh, adaptations that help them um, succeed. Um, bears, many of my, um, most folks know that bears will have their cubs in the winter in their dens. Uh, and those cubs, uh, especially the newborn cubs, will just hang out with mom um, and feed, you know, nurse and get larger and larger. So they're up and mobile when they're, it's time to leave the den. Um, and often you'll you'll find them under a root ball, um, tucked under and trying to stay warm with mom. Um, other um, interesting um, strategies related to reproduction, so things like otters that actually will uh, delay the implement, implantation of their eggs um, in uterine walls uh, to coincide with um, what birth timings to resources being ample. Um, we have active mating seasons, which is a warning for folks now, especially if you have dogs. Make sure you're looking outside uh, for skunk. Um, it is skunk breeding month, and they are walking around all over the place looking for uh, love. It is Valentine's Day, so we got to mention a little bit of love. Um, and it is a common time of the year for, for many dogs to run into skunks and get sprayed, and tomato soup um, and paste is, is a very a uh, useful tool for that, but there's some other ones out there. Um, other things that are going on, a lot of our waterfowl, uh, as they're on their wintering grounds um, here in Kentucky, uh, are going through their pairing rituals and dances uh, to uh, line up their mates for the impending uh, spring migration. Wood ducks are actively searching out nesting sites right now together. Um, so you have other things going on. Life continues outside of just trying to stay alive. Um, you, you know, if it's your, your ultimate goal here is to pass your genes on uh, to the next generation. Speaking of which, amphibians are, are also in that boat. It is time for the salamander migrations and breeding, um, where you have, uh, especially on warmer, wet spring nights, early spring nights, uh, like now, if we got a, a 55 degree night with some rain, you could go out and you would see salamanders uh, venturing out, crossing the roads, looking for water sources to uh, find, make, lay their eggs. Um, a common one you see, especially here in the Lexington area, is the spotted salamander, and they get they can get into the incredibly high density, um, where you may come up and see a hundred plus salamanders in one small little pond or puddle, um, and they're all trying to pass on and lay eggs and and have take advantage of um, a lot of times the presence of vernal pools right now. Um, where we have a, a excess of water in, in our um, landscape, uh, evapotranspiration is not causing our trees to take the, up that extra water and, and have it evaporate off the leaves. So you have vernal pools, which are just small little temporary ponds um, of varying sizes that are now present in the landscape because we have that surplus of, of uh, precipitation. Uh, so these guys are taking advantage of that uh, opportunity now. And, um, you know, it's a, it doesn't exist in most other times of the year. You go out in August, there's not a lot of puddles out there. Uh, so their timing is all related to winter and um, the fact that, you know, even they could be almost iced over and they're still going to use them for reproduction. So there's a lot more of those kind of things going on. Um, uh, many, many species that we have in Kentucky, I didn't even get into a lot of the fish components or, you know, um, they're a little buffered uh, from the winter climate being in water, but um, there's a lot going on and, and many, many cool things that allow uh, wildlife to survive our winter. Well, thank you for that, Matt. I greatly appreciate that. And, um, you know, I'm going to have a mental note. You and Jonathan are not allowed on the same show at the same time. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I do wish that they could figure out that brain growing thing. That would be really awesome. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please type them in the chat pod uh, for either uh, Dr. Springer or Dr. Larson. Um, but Matt, you, were, you mentioned one thing about the moles would bite the head off a worm. How do I know which ends the head? <laughs> I don't. 
I don't Maybe know. Maybe that's a Jonathan question. I'm, I'm just like. Jonathan, you have any idea of how to tell which side's up on a worm? How do they, I mean, I'm just curious. But like, how do they know? Because to me, they look the same on both ends. <laughs> Uh, my joking answer would be maybe they just ask, but uh, I would say <laughs> more truthfully, it probably has to do with the clitellum on the worm. There may be a way that they, the critter that we're talking about here can feel it, and that would be closer to the head end. Hmm. Interesting. All right. I was just curious because it didn't. I, I, I was going to go with whatever way was trying to go away from them. That's probably that's, a, that, but yeah, uh, that's a good point. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. All right. Well, it doesn't look like we have any questions. So thank you both very much for being on the show. I appreciate it. I'm sure I will have you both back on for some uh, other wildlife or uh, insect topic. And I appreciate you joining us today. Have a good one. So um, again, we appreciate you as well for joining us um, every week on From the Woods Today. If you have any questions whatsoever, um, there's a little survey uh, from the woods today .com that you can click on that and you can send us any kind of information that you would have a question about. You could also see any of our past shows. They're all on there, uh, minus today's, of course, but it'll be on there in about a week. Um, you can go back and, and see anything that we have had broadcast for the last almost three years now. So um, we greatly appreciate you joining us. Um, if you have, again, if you have any uh, comments or concerns, just let us know. You can email me also at forestry.extension at uky.edu. Until then, take care and we will see you next week. Bye. From the woods today.